Welcome to the Close the Chapter podcast. I am Kristen Boyce, a licensed marriage and family therapist with a private practice, Pathways to Healing Counseling. Through conversations, education, strategies, and shared stories, we will be closing the chapter on all the thoughts, feelings, people, and circumstances that don't serve you anymore and open the door to possibilities and the real you. You won't want to miss an episode, so be sure to subscribe. Welcome to the Close the Chapter podcast. I am so grateful you are here with me and my special guest today. If you've ever struggled with anxiety, OCD, which is obsessive compulsive disorder of any kind, you're going to want to tune into this episode, or maybe you have a loved one that's struggling, a friend, a coworker, a family member, a colleague, the list is endless. We all have some form of anxiety, and we're going to be talking about what makes it turn into OCD. How does it develop? What are the signs? How do we work through it? How do we manage it? All that good stuff. So I know your time is valuable, and the fact that you're here with us speaks volumes, and I am so grateful that you're on a growth journey of self-discovery and wanting to really discover who you authentically really are. I'm so glad you're here with us. So without further ado, let me introduce you to my amazing guest today that I'm so grateful is on the podcast, Medina Alam, licensed mental health counselor. And you are the clinical operations director for the mid-region of No CD. Her current work includes treating individuals with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And she's also provides and manages the operations and clinical competency for the organization. Previously, she has contributed to the training and onboarding of therapists who are new to OCD and ERP. What is ERP for those that might not know? Exposure response prevention, which I'm sure we'll talk a lot more about today. Yes, we will dive deep into that. And she is a lover of all things fitness and well-being. And you're also a yoga instructor or yoga teacher. Yeah, I am certified to teach yoga, but I'm currently not formally teaching. Well, welcome to the Close the Chapter podcast. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I am thrilled you're here. This is a subject I have not covered a lot about anxiety, but we've never talked about OCD. So yeah. let's first define what is OCD yeah. and really how does it develop? So and if you want to add anything about your background, feel free to jump in with that too. You did my background perfectly. So thank you. OCD stands for obsessive compulsive disorder. So really the presentation of it is what we call obsessions. So these are intrusive or unwanted. They can be thoughts, images, urges that are typically followed with what we call compulsions. So these are behaviors that can be mental or physical that a person will do to essentially reduce their discomfort or distress in the moment. And so because there's that cyclical cycle of each time someone does that behavior or that compulsion, it strengthens the fear. So the fear is stronger. So they want to do the behavior more. So it goes back and forth and it becomes impairing to their life. So it'll impact different areas, which is what makes it clinical. As far as how it develops, there is a nature and nurture like most disorders that play in conjunction. So if you do have a first relative with OCD, you are more likely to develop it genetically, but also is probably things that maybe you observed growing up in childhood. The world is a scary place is something that is often taught to people with OCD unconsciously, right? Through the caregiver's behaviors. How much trauma does trauma play into the development of OCD? Like if someone has any type of abuse, neglect, whether it's sexual, physical, emotional, unprocessed grief, traumatic loss, how much does that play into developing OCD? I don't know that I would say it's like one of the main factors as far as developing OCD in particular, but we know that people who've experienced upsetting things might have a predisposition to developing anything, right? Because they they just experience that upsetting memory. So their tolerance might be a little bit lower. And this might be a little off topic, but I'm going to say it because I think it's important. Trauma and OCD have a lot of symptoms that are very similar. And so it can often be treated in a very similar way as well. That's what I found with EMDR, eye movement, desensitization, reprocessing. There's many yeah. modalities. There's brain spotting, somatic experiencing. There's a lot of modalities that treat OCD. What are the symptoms that you first see with someone that comes in with OCD? 
The first noteworthy thing I'll notice is usually someone's been struggling for a very long time with OCD and didn't know. And so usually by the time they're seeing me, it's been years and years. Onset is typically pretty early in childhood. And part of the reason we have no CD is because there is such a misperception on what OCD is. And so that is why people struggle for such a long time. But typically what people will present with is there's some sort of like chaos or disruption in their life because of the obsessions and the compulsions. And so, yeah, did that answer your question? (laughs) Yes. And I'm wondering, like you said, early onset, do you have an age typically that you've researched says it develops often within this age range? Don't quote me, but I believe it. it's 10. It's something around that, like 7 to 12. I feel like I should know that off the top of my head and I don't. I know it's like pretty early. And typically that's a good way to understand too, if someone is currently presenting with OCD, if you go back into their history, there's typically something kind of peculiar around like the way they thought. Maybe when I was seven, I worried that I was going to get AIDS. Something a little bit above and beyond than like a general anxiety of like, oh no, like hopefully I handed in my schoolwork. Although OCD can present that way too. It might just be a little bit more out there. Some people think it's like I count and they think, well, I don't have the (laughs) counting thing, but I have rituals. Like I need to touch the doorknob and then I need to go back and check the lock and then I have to go back and check the doorknob. Like is that patterns and rituals a part of OCD from your experience? Yeah, I'm so glad you said that because there is such a like linear way that people see OCD. So it's like counting or like cleaning or like organization, which OCD can manifest that way. But there are a lot of other. So there's four main types of OCD. One that many people might not know about is called harm OCD. So maybe this fear that I could harm myself, this fear that I could harm someone else. And it's followed by oftentimes a lot of actual like mental rituals. So rumination on like, Do I actually feel like I would harm that person? Do I want to do something like that? Do I want to live? And it's very distinct from actual suicidal or homicidal ideation. And so just kind of understanding the different ways OCD can present is really important. And again, such a big part of why this organization exists is to get the word out because people with harm OCD for a lot of times are struggling with it and don't even know what's going on. Or providers have that unfortunately so sad, a lot of providers don't fully understand OCD. And so I have clients I've seen who have literally been sent to the emergency room or like this put inpatient because their provider thought that they were homicidal or suicidal when they really had OCD or have OCD. Yeah, that's a good distinction. What are the other three? You mentioned four. Yeah. So contamination, which is another really common one. So like germs, harm, unacceptable thoughts. So these might be things like What if I'm not the sexual orientation I think I am? Or what if I'm a pedophile? And then symmetry or just right. So that's like kind of the organization. And let me say this too, because this is interesting. Sorry, I get so hyped talking about this. I love it. So just right, your symmetry can manifest that way. So like maybe organizing or putting things in a particular way, but it can also manifest very somatically. So I don't feel quite right. So these are people who oftentimes might have an overestimation of like their body sensations. And so maybe people who chronically go to the doctor, like there's something wrong with me, or what does that sensation mean? Or I don't feel quite right. What does that mean? So it can manifest in that way as well. That's really helpful to break it down in those four ways. Because people think the movie with Jack Nicholson, as good as it gets, what you just took a breath, tell me about. I'm actually really bad with movies, so I have no idea what you're talking about. So I haven't watched that movie. <laughs> That's okay. It's old. It's an old movie. But basically, Jack Nicholson is, I mean, whether it's leaving the house, he has a germ phobia. So he has to bring plastic silverware with him to eat. He has to have the waitress act a certain way towards him. So he's mm-hmm. kind of controlling. I mean, it comes across as controlling, but underneath it's driven by fear. So the whole movie is centered around his anxiety and his fear and how he works through it, through exposure and building this relationship with the waitress. So let's talk a little bit about exposure therapy. So exposure response prevention is ERP is actually the number one treatment used for OCD. And actually there's a lot of research that it's the number one treatment for a lot of anxiety disorders. 
I have a small private practice too, where I'll treat not just OCD, but just general anxiety. And I use exposure there as well. So basically what you're doing is you're physically exposing the individual to whatever it is that they're fearing, and you're teaching them to essentially respond differently. So the whole crux of this treatment is that we're not necessarily getting rid of uncomfortable thoughts, images, urges, sensations, or uncomfortable situations, because we can't, right? If we could prevent bad things from happening, life would be a lot different for all of us. But we're teaching people that they can respond differently to what they're experiencing. So the big difference between someone who has OCD or another anxiety disorder that's clinical and versus someone who doesn't is the person with the anxiety disorder has a thought that pops in, for example. So I might be driving and think, oh, what if I veer off the road and run over this baby carriage this mom is pushing? What if I do that, right? So the person without OCD might be like, oh, that was kind of weird and move on with their day. Someone with OCD or anxiety might stop their car. They might park it and get out and decide not to drive anymore. And then maybe they spend the whole day ruminating on what if I actually hit the baby and I don't remember. And now I'm Googling on internet to see if there was some sort of news article, right? Maybe I'm calling the cops to see if someone reported this, right? And so it wasn't that the thought itself was different because everyone, I'm sure yourself included, we've had peculiar thoughts like that. It wasn't the thought that was the issue. It was everything that we did in response to the thought. And the thought controlled, it became almost like it really happened in the mind or could happen. Well, the interesting thing with that is the way we can either strengthen or kill a fear is the behavior. So the person who's not driving, Googling, calling the cops, those behaviors actually made the fear feel more real than the person who said, well, that was weird and moved on. So this, I love sharing this back. I'm going to share it with you. So the play, and you might know this, but for the listeners, the place in your brain where anxiety and fear lives doesn't understand language. And so I could sit here and say, well, I know I didn't run over a baby carriage. I would remember that. But then if I did all those other behaviors, right, I stopped driving, I Google, maybe I call my mom and say, do you think that I would run over a baby and hit it and run, right? All those behaviors strengthen the fear because that's all fear could hear here, right? In quotations, because it was paying attention to how you behaved. And so I love talking about OCD, but I also think all these skills are so relevant for anyone. Like I use these skills every day. Think of something you've been scared of, everyone listening. Think of something you've been scared of. How did you get over it, right? Can you think of something you were scared of and how you got over it? A spider. So can you think of something that you've done to maybe get less scared of spiders? I think it's my thinking around spiders. Like, okay, I'm bigger than the spider. It's okay. They're not going to hurt me, even though they could bite me. I don't think it's my thought. If I'm processing it right now, it's my thought over the spider hurting me. I feel like I don't feel it doesn't have that body response like it used to because I got bit by a spider, had to have my leg cut open. It was a big thing. So there's a reason. So it makes sense. I was smaller when that happened. So that made sense to me. But now it's like, I'm okay. I can handle this. It's my thought around it. Yeah. But I like how you said the behavior can strengthen depending the fear. That's huge what you just said. Yes. And so every, I think, again, OCD or not, anything you do in your life, is your behavior aligning with your values or is it aligning with your fears? Is because- the behavior aligning with your values or aligning with your fears? So if someone has the compulsion and they're like, I just feel compelled to get out of the car, stop driving, to use your example, like that compulsion takes over and that's where their behavior goes. Talk to me about that. Well, that's when you teach people that discomfort is important because really what they're saying is it feels too uncomfortable, so I need to leave. And so the interesting part about being an ERP therapist is we're actually doing the opposite of what we're taught in school, right? In school, we're set, we're like, make them feel better, you know, reassure them, tell them it's going to be okay. I actually do the opposite. And you said something that was really important. You said, well, I could get hurt by the spider. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Because you can, you can get hurt by the spider. There is a chance you run someone over when you drive. Maybe you choke on your food later today. Maybe we could all die at any moment, right? And I'm not saying this to sound morbid. It's the reality of the situation. 
And so when I accept that there's uncertainty embedded in literally everything, I can at least live my life because what's happening with OCD and anxiety is that it's telling you falsely that you can avoid discomfort, but why does everyone come see me? They're uncomfortable. So really you didn't avoid anything. And now you're spending a lot of time and energy trying to avoid, and you're still feeling uncomfortable. So I don't want to get rid of the discomfort for you because it's valuable for so many reasons. I know that might sound weird, but if I could, I can't avoid discomfort for you. I don't have that skill. I can only teach you again how to respond to it differently. So the first skill you kind of had us try on was asking, what were you afraid of and how did you get through it? Yeah. So what are some of the other skills when you're talking about you can teach these skills so people can get through it? I think one thing you said is accepting uncertainty. Like we all, I don't know what's going to happen one second from now, right? We do. I have no idea. And getting, that's the goal of the therapy is to help people just accept discomfort and uncertainty and be able to tolerate it and manage it. Yes. So that is a good like place to start is to acknowledge like, yeah, anything is possible. And then another thing I like to teach people is, or to show people is to physically do whatever they're scared of. So I could sit here all day and tell you all the reasons why I'm sure you would be fine if a spider came in. But again, anxiety doesn't hear that. So I could be logical with you for the next 60 minutes and you're still going to leave feeling, ah, I don't know, right? The best way would be to experience the spider, right? And I think it's interesting because it sounds like your worst case scenario did happen. And I'm sure you would prefer it didn't happen and it obviously impacts you, but you also figured it out. You managed, right? And that's the big thing with anxiety is that it doubts our ability to be resilient. And so sometimes, which this might sound, people might be like, Medina is a therapist, what? But I want some of my members, and we call our clients at no CD members, by the way. So if you hear me say that, that's why. But I want individuals to experience sometimes those worst case scenarios to show them that they can handle it. It doesn't mean that they liked it or they want it to happen again. It just means that they figured it out and they couldn't prevent it from happening because that's what so much of anxiety is driven towards is this false perception that we can prevent bad things from happening. Oh, isn't that true? (laughs) Don't we want like we don't want bad things to happen? Yeah. Or but we it, don't want someone to get hurt, including ourselves or other people, our kids, our family, whatever. We don't want to go through loss and grief and trauma and that, those emotions. Right. Which is valid, right? Those are not like, they're not fun feelings. And I also like to point out oftentimes that desire to avoid those things actually winds up being a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the very thing, I'll use contamination OCD is a very clear example. The very thing a person with contamination OCD is trying to avoid getting sick, they're actually behaving in a way that increases their chances of getting sick by, for example, washing their hands so much that now their hands are cracked. And now it's a breeding ground for getting sick versus if your hands were not cracked. So again, the very thing the person is trying to avoid, they've actually increased the chances of that happening. That's like their worst nightmare. But they believe in their mind that they're preventing. So how do you break through that? Like that belief that they're really feel like they're protecting and preventing something bad happening. It's like that compulsion to say, no, I am actually, I believe that I'm protecting myself. How do you break through that? The only way you can break through is to stop the behavior. So you would, so typically you would like slowly titrate off the compulsion. So say like someone's washing their hands 10 times after touching something dirty. I might have them touch something dirty and let's wash it eight times instead. Wash your hands eight times. And let's just sit with that discomfort. Sit with the chance that maybe your hands are dirty. Maybe you'll get contaminated. And then maybe next time we do six and then slowly go down and down. And let's see what happens. And then I always like to point out the fallacies, right? Because you wash your hands so much, you must never get sick. Almost always. Well, no, I've been sick. I'm sick all the time, actually. I'm sick. So are you telling me the very thing that anxiety said to do so you don't feel this or get this or become sick actually didn't work? And now you're spending three hours washing the day when you could be hanging out with your child or going for a bike ride or living your life. And it's that emphasis of there's always uncertainty, whether we act out of our values or we act out of our fear, there's always uncertainty. So we might as well act out of our values and still have that uncertainty. 
Yeah, that's the end result, right? To get someone to that point where they can live that way because anxiety doesn't disappear totally. I mean, you were going to say something around that. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, I'm so glad you brought that up because that is the last piece, I think. And I'm sure you probably experienced this too, is sometimes I truly think people are over pathologizing things that really are just ways of responding that are, I don't want to say normal because I, I don't know if I love that word, but are ways that make sense, right? We respond in ways that make sense. And so I think the last piece of treatment is always teaching the person that, yeah, sometimes you're going to feel anxious because sometimes what I notice, or a lot of times what I notice is, Medina, I feel anxious and I don't know why, and I don't know where it's coming from. And it's like, wait, 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 wait. So now we're going to worry about why we're worrying. Or Mm -hmm. I feel a little anxious today, but I'm going to still go out and ride my bike. And I'm still going to cook dinner for myself. And I'm still going to call my friend on the phone, even though I have that anxiety there, kind of like background music. Because the last thing you want to do is to stop and halt our lives to try to figure out why we feel anxious. Because people want to know why. Like why I had someone just, and I won't give away a detail. They had a phobia of straw wrappers, wet straw wrappers. And I was trying to get underneath, like, where is this coming from? Well, she had a procedure when she was younger. Yeah. And I was like, well, maybe the wrapper that the, when they had to do the procedure, she has an unconscious memory of a wrapper wrapped next to her. Like we could not get, and does that matter to figure out the root of it? I don't think so. And this is going to be, the, again, the difference between talk therapy and ERP. A lot of times I'll actually gently interrupt and say, we don't need to know why. We just know that this is upsetting for you. And how can we get over? Oh, we can get over it by let's get some wrappers right now. Because that's the trick that anxiety plays these individuals to get back on top. It's like, let's spend, I have sometimes, and I giggle at this, and sometimes I can get my members to giggle at this too. Let's figure out why I don't feel anxious today. What? We're going to sit and ruminate on why you don't feel anxious? Or can we go out and live life like a rock star because I feel amazing? Almost this rumination on constantly checking how you feel and like determining if that's the way you should quote unquote or not feel should or shouldn't feel versus just like accepting like, yeah, I'm human. So sometimes I feel anxious. Sometimes I feel sad. Sometimes I feel really great. Sometimes I feel even and accepting that. Accepting that it's okay. Whatever you're feeling in that moment, whether it's you feeling even, you don't feel anxious, you feel And that's scary for a lot of people with OCD because they're waiting for the next bad thing to happen. And so they want to prevent it. Again, that false like belief that I can prevent bad things from happening. Ah. And the only way, and I know I said this already, but I'm going to say it again because I think it's valuable is we can truly believe that we can't prevent bad things from happening is to make sure our behavior is aligned with that. Because most people listening, whether you have OCD or not, know we can't prevent bad things from happening, right? We logically can. But is your behavior matching up with that logic? Is your behavior matching up with the logic of that you cannot prevent bad things from happening? So you're looking at your behavior as a cue to say, am I trying to behave in a way that protects me? And I'm spending all my time trying to behave in a way to protect me? Or am I behaving in a way that just is living out my values? Is that the question? Yeah, that's exactly what like the end goal would be. I always say the best ERP is that you live your life despite what you're scared of. You live your life despite... I'm repeating these because they're so important for people to hear again. Uh, Living your life despite what you're afraid of because you're living with fear. You're befriending the fear in a sense. I love using this analogy because I think it makes sense. So if I go to the grocery store and my task at hand is to get my groceries, but I get to the store and there's like, a really annoying like song playing on the background. I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of country. So for me, it'd be a country song that I don't really like, right? And so I wouldn't necessarily stop getting my groceries to go to the front desk and ask them to change the song. I would still get my groceries, even though that song was playing on in the background. So it's like either that anxiety or that thought, right? I might have those unwanted thoughts in the background. I might have that unwanted feeling in the background, but I still live my life and do the thing that I need to do. And you can think of this even with depression, right? Behavior activation, you're getting up and you're doing the dishes, even though you don't feel like doing it. I'm going over to my mom's house, even though I might have a fear that I could kill her. 
cooking for my friends, even though I'm scared I can contaminate their food and they could get sick because I value hanging out with my friends and I value hanging out with my mom. And you need to take care of yourself and go to groceries. Yes. I value having food in my place, right? I use the example of every time I go to eat, I could choke, but I value not feeling hungry. Like that's really important to me. I could get into a car accident today, but I value my independence. Yeah. So this whole idea of not knowing the why, there are some clients where we do EMDR, what I just explained, that's a form of trauma therapy. I don't, do you do EMDR? I don't, but I know what it is. Okay. And so we might target the straw wrapper, right? Uh And just see, and that's how we can discover, oh, I did have a surgery. And then the client, and it doesn't mean we're going to fixate on the, we're going to reprocess what might've gotten stuck in the nervous system, the body sensations, right? That fear that they feel so afraid, reprocess that and let that come up and out of the body. And so it sounds like with ERP, because I don't do exposure therapy or exposure prevention work in that way, it's different in the sense that you are actually, does it have to actually be the thing like, or can you imagine it happening? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah. So there's two different types of exposures you can do. So you can do the, what we call in vivo. So that's real life where you recreate it, but we can't always recreate it. So we can do imaginal exposures. So I might have someone write a worst case scenario script of what would happen if they got their friends sick. And the cool thing about this is a lot of times you can get to what's called the core fear. So the underneath fear of why they're so scared of getting their friends sick. And it might be eventually that I'm scared that my friends would hate me and they would leave me and I'd be left all alone. And so you would essentially have them reread that script over and over to get them. Essentially, we call it habituation, right? You get used to something when you read it over and over again. And you teach yourself that just because I say or think something doesn't mean it will happen. And Something that people with OCD are notorious for is what we call thought action fusion. So this idea that if I think, feel, or say something, that means it's true. And so when you have them say something and test out that quote hypothesis, like, so if you say you're a pedophile, that now means you're all of a sudden a pedophile. Well, let's test it out. Because someone with OCD will say, well, like, no, logically I know, but I'm never going to say the word. So again, the behavior is not matching up. And so you would expose them. I know I'm getting a little off the original question, but you would expose them to saying these things out loud to show them, A, they can get used to it and they can handle the discomfort, but also that because they say something doesn't mean it's true. So how does somebody that has, let's say they really struggle with these ruminating thoughts and compulsions, they just walk me through some additional skills that you would help them with to really interrupt that from taking action, like their behavior, right? The thought to the behavior. What are some other things that people can do? I think with rumination in particular, because a lot of times people will say like, well, I don't even know that I'm doing it, right? I think it's really, really important to help inform the individual, the difference between thought and thinking, because they are right. We cannot control thought. So thought is what pops in. So the thought of, oh, what if I run over this baby carriage. That itself I cannot control because that's where people get tripped up. I think they think they can control that thought. They cannot. We all have intrusive, odd thoughts like that. Now, everything after that thought, all the stuff I'm conjuring up, the effort, that is what you can control. So I think the first and foremost thing is to understand there's a difference between thought and thinking. So you're not trying to control the wrong thing. And then it's just progression, right? As soon as you do catch yourself thinking or conjuring up that information, you respond with what we call a response prevention message. Well, this is what I do, at least. I know some therapists do it differently, but I'll have them, once they do acknowledge that they are ruminating, I'll have them create a message that acknowledges the uncertainty. So maybe I did run over that baby. And I would have them say that on repeat sometimes, right? Maybe that is possible. I could have done that right? I'm acknowledging that uncertainty and I'm almost approaching the fear in the sense of there's so much stuff I could talk about. I feel like I keep going a little off topic. No, you're great. This is good. It's similar to like, if you were to tickle yourself, right? Are you ticklish by chance? Uh, Depends on where, not real ticklish. (laughs) Okay. Go with that because a lot of people are. Okay. Yeah. So think of it. If you're ticklish, I know for myself, I'm extremely ticklish. If someone else tickles me, it's so funny, right? I can't stop laughing. If I tickle myself, it is not, I'm not laughing, right? 
And so ERP is kind of like that. When you willingly do something, right? Because I'm willingly tickling myself, it's not funny. But if someone else does it, right? It's not something that's in my control. It's all of a sudden funny. So exposure is like that. If I willingly do something scary, then it's no longer as scary typically. So when I willingly say like, yeah, maybe I did do that, or I willingly keep driving, or I willingly acknowledge all that uncertainty, the fear kind of dies. Because again, the behavior doesn't match up. If I really ran over someone, why would I keep driving? So fear dwindles after that. Well, I mean, she was so dangerous. She wouldn't keep driving. So behavior keeps going. You're not changing your behavior because of the thinking. Because the thinking is not all too accurate. It's a little backwards to a lot of like talk therapy. Like I'll say things that are provoking, right? Like, yeah, maybe you did do that. That is possible. And they're like, what? How do they respond when you say maybe you did? Well, I think I would like to think I give enough psychoeducation so they understand. So a lot of times they actually laugh because they think they understand where I'm going with it. And the realness of the situation is anything anyone is coming to me with, I don't know. So that is like the truest answer I can give. Telling them it's okay or they're going to be okay is false. I don't know. I don't know if you or I are going to be okay today. That's the realness of the situation. And so back to your original question, skills. The first one is to decipher between thought and thinking. And then when you do notice thinking to insert it with the message that acknowledges and accepts uncertainty, and then moving on with your day. Because really what you'll notice with anxiety disorders is anxiety wants you to stop and just like ruminate all day. Yes. They would love it for you to camp out right there. Like you'll hear all the time, I'm sure you do too, is in the morning, Medina, I just wake up and I'm anxious. 99% of the time I'll ask them, are you laying in bed when you wake up? And 99% of the time they say, yes. It's like, stop laying in bed. And when you wake up in the morning, I want you to get right up and start moving on with your day. Because the reason you're waking up, you're not really waking up anxious. What you're telling me is you're waking up and you're laying in bed and you're thinking, and now you feel anxious. That's such a good point for people (laughs) to know, get up and move your body. Yeah. If you feel anxious in the morning, that's so counterintuitive. They don't feel like it. Like a lot of people with anxiety don't feel like it. They don't feel motivated. They feel scared. So you're like, you've got to change the behavior. Then the thinking will change, sort of. In a way. So what I think happens is you don't have any less intrusive thoughts or uncomfortable sensations, but because you've given them less attention, they don't bug you as much. So a lot of times, like towards the end of treatment, people will tell me like, yeah, I haven't really had any intrusive thoughts. I know that's a lie you have but you just didn't notice them as much. And so that that goes back to my original point is that it's not the thought that's the issue. It's the way we're responding. This is, glad you said the thing about motivation because with anything, anxiety, depression, the issue lies in trying to wait to feel motivated. You don't feel motivated and then behave. You behave and then you feel motivated. And we have it backwards. So if I am only waiting and Think of like working out, right? That's probably like the number one thing that people are like, oh, I wish I had more motivation to do. I don't think people really feel motivated to work out. You work out and then you usually feel motivated after. And so just switching that for yourself to know that it's not that I need to wait for that feeling. Really what they're saying is I don't feel quite right to do the behavior. Exactly. Okay, so that's a great tip. That's a great skill. What other skills? Along the lines of values and fears, I love having people create a list of values and a list of fears and kind of carry it around with them in any moment, just randomly throughout the day, look down, am I acting out of my values or am I acting out of my fears? Because again, that distrust that anxiety instills in people like, well, I don't know. I don't know. Am I? It's like, look at the list. What do you think? So that's, is that's tip. My other really good tip. I think I'm like over here, like my tips are so I love your tips. These are great. (laughs) Thank you. Another tip would be to check in on reassurance seeking. So people with anxiety disorders often ask for so much reassurance. And the research shows the more you ask for someone to reassure you about something, the more unsure you feel. That is boom, drop the mic right there. I call it survey says. Yeah. What do you think? Do you think it says? And they're surveying everybody. And the research shows the more you survey, the more you seek reassurance the less reassured you're going to feel. In the moment, people will be like, well, no, I feel better if someone tells me I'm going to be okay. Yes, that's that temporary sense of relief. And that's what hooks you in. 
I want to validate. That's why we do compulsive like behavior. It feels good. It's the same thing with drinking or maybe unhealthy eating habits or poor decisions. In the moment, they feel good, but long term, they just hook you in. And so, yeah, the more reassurance, I'm going to say it again because I think it's important. The more reassurance you ask for, the less reassured you feel. And that temporary hit, I caught like a shot in the arm. Like you're like, ooh, I feel a little better, but then it comes right back. And it teaches that you can't handle discomfort. Yes. I'm so quick to try to get rid of it. Again, that behavior anxiety is like, she can't handle, he or she can't handle that. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to give you an example. Let's do this because this is, I just, I'm in the deep end of this and I love it. So I have two teen daughters and one wants to ask me all the time, what do you think of this, this outfit? I'm like, what do you think of the outfit? And she will keep going until she gets an answer that feels because she's anxious, whether how she looks and does this look okay? How do you disrupt that? Like that needing reassurance of the outfit. I'm giving you a benign example, but let's just play this out. How would you handle that skill wise? Yeah, I would probably give some psychoeducation on what she's doing, right? Asking reassurance and how you really care about helping her feel more secure in what she's wearing, right? So that's what she's looking for is that security. She probably yes. feel that. And so because that's important for you to help her with, I would tell her, I would say like, I actually will not be reassuring you. So I've done things like if someone in session asks me for reassurance and I've already gone through my spiel of I'm not giving you any reassurance because I care about you and that's an OCD symptom, I might just stare at you until you realize what you're doing. And then they're like, oh, interesting because it's that modeling to the point where a lot of my clients literally can catch it before they say it. They start talking. They're like, oh no, I know you're not going to answer that. They'll say that. And I'm like, yes, I love that because they realized they weren't going to get what they needed. So that's how I would approach that situation. That's so good. I mean, just, and I like the psychoeducation piece, meaning you're teaching people that the more you ask for reassurance, the less assured you're going to feel like it's, you're not going to feel more confident. You're not going to feel more reassured long-term that's not going to be the solution to what you're looking for relief. You're looking for certainty. Yeah. You're looking for security and it's not going to offer you that. Right. The reason that that's so important is because this, so this type of therapy can easily feel like you're being in a hole. I won't swear on here, but like, I'm like, sometimes I'm like, oh yeah, gosh, I can come across that way. Right. And so I even say that to my individuals, like in the beginning of treatment, like you are going to experience me very differently than maybe a talk therapist you've been to. And here's why. If I'm ever coming off like an a-hole, it's probably because OCD or anxiety is trying to run the session. And my hope again, this, right? The therapeutic model is the hope that they model how you have been with them, right? So if I'm really stern and strict and direct with their OCD, the hope and goal is that they're that way when I'm not around, that they're like, actually, no, I'm not going to do that because fear says it. I'm going to do what I want out of my values, not what fear says I need to do. How do you integrate self-compassion into it or compassion in general? I love the go-to statements of you got this, you can handle this because it's not telling them we're going to be okay. Because again, I don't know, but I know that you can handle hard things. And so I like to implement those kinds of statements. This is so good. This is such a good conversation around. I know. I feel like the time flew by. I was like, what? Did it it fly (laughs) by? How did you get into this work? Now you've got me curious, specifically with OCD. So it's interesting. I was recruited by No CD over two years ago, but I was ironically practicing ERP, but didn't know it. So I... As you said in the beginning, I'm very into yoga. I, you know, I'm a yoga instructor. So a lot of the, I guess, philosophies of yoga and like Buddhism and things like that are very similar to this idea of leaning into discomfort. And I was literally reading a book, Comfortable with Uncertainty, before I even discovered this, which is literally the crux of ERP. And so that's really what has kept me in the field is I just truly love the concepts of it. I practice it in my everyday life. I see it work because I think that's the other thing is a lot of therapy and anyone who has OCD or thinks they might have OCD, find a specialist because talk therapy is actually counterintuitive and can worsen the symptoms. But in any, just so cool to see it work and people literally get their lives back. That's amazing. What books or resources would you recommend? Maybe one or two that you think are the best, like you find the most helpful if someone wants to dive a little deeper. The book I just mentioned, 
comfortable with uncertainty. It's not like an OCD book per se, but it's very applicable to the concepts. That's by Pema Shrodran. I love oh her. I know. I've like literally read all of her books. She's amazing. And then if it's okay with you, I have like a link to an article that I think is phenomenal that maybe you can link in your bio for this. That'd be awesome. Can okay. you, you'll send it to me and we'll link it in the show notes. Yeah. It's a pretty brief article on different ways we can respond to unwanted thoughts. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. So if people are learning, want to know more about you, where can they find you? My Instagram handle is mental health underscore Medina underscore, which I'm sure you'll probably link. So I won't spell it. And yeah, you guys can find me there. If you follow me, say hi. I try to post recently learned how to do some reels. I feel like sometimes I'm like a 90 year old stuck in a 30 year old. Me too. I am just, I'm like, what is, what are we doing now? Oh, we're doing reels. Oh no. And then there's like levels to the reels too. Like we're, and I'm like, I'm not on that level yet. (laughs) Oh, I can't. And then we can mix in things. No, no, no. I can't do that. Yeah, I'm with you. So Instagram is the best way to kind of find you. Awesome. Yeah. So I do have my small practice. If you are interested, you can, you know, message me through there and then I'll give you like further details on how to communicate. I'm not unfortunately accepting any people at no CD right now, but if you are feeling like you're struggling with OCD, please call us. We have a lot of therapists in all the states. So wherever you're located, we can find you the help you need. Fantastic. Thank you, Medina. It's been such a great conversation. I am so grateful for your heart and what you're doing in the world. This is such a good topic. And you gave so many helpful strategies on how to start really leaning into the discomfort, facing those fears, watching the behavior, because that seems to be one of the keys, and coming up with a new embraced way of life. Instead of letting it control you, you're kind of embracing the uncertainty. Well, thank you. That was a really thoughtful thing to say. And hopefully it was helpful. And I really had so much fun talking to you too. It was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Close the Chapter podcast. My hope is that you took home some actionable steps along with motivation, inspiration, and hope for making sustainable change in your life. If you enjoyed this episode, click the subscribe button to be sure to get the updated episodes every week and share with a friend or a family member. For more information about how to get connected, visit Kristen, K-R-I-S-T-E-N, D Boyce, B-O-I-C-E dot com. Thanks and have a great day.